introduction. I've been producing a number of videos criticizing the influence of Hegelian idealism. And in a discussion which followed one of these, one of the commentators, I can't remember whether it was on YouTube or Facebook, claimed that Hegel had made significant contributions to orbital mechanics and had proven wrong, Newton wrong in some areas. In particular, it was claimed that Hegel put the inverse square law of gravity on firm footings. And I therefore read Hegel's work on the orbit of the planets to check. My conclusion is that it, it's a load of pretentious stupidity. And in this video, I will explain. Adventuring idealism. Why is this relevant? Well, insofar as Hegel has had a positive or significant reputation in the 20th century, it's down to Hegel being seen as having played a role in the formation of modern communism. In the period around the Russian Revolution, he was credited with having contributed one of the component parts of communist doctrine. And a prominent Russian politician wrote, Marx didn't stop at 18th century materialism. He developed philosophy to a higher level. He enriched it with the achievements of German classical philosophy, especially of Hegel's system, which in its turn led to the materialism of Feuerbach. The main achievement was dialectics, i.e. the doctrine of the development in its fullest and deepest and most comprehensive form, the doctrine of the relativity of human knowledge that provides us with the reflection of eternally developing matter. And that comes from a guy called Lenin. Now, this stamp of approval from someone as prominent as, as Lenin encouraged Marxists to pay attention to him, and in the process, Hegel's otherwise forgotten objections to the materialist science of the 17th and 18th century were partially revived in the 20th century. In a debate between the, what are called the Soviet mechanists and the hegel influence de Boren school, we see the idealism of Hegel being reborn we see the de Boren side echoing Hegel's objections to mechanics as relying on external forces. It's not clear why it's supposed to be a bad thing for forces to be external to particles. This provides an entry route into communist ideology for some very reactionary idealist conceptions. Indeed, even within the USSR, the de Boren school were later criticised for what was called Menshevising idealism. Greg Michelson has a good set of online lecture notes on how the de Boronite Menshevising idealism held back the progress of computer technology in the USSR. You can follow that um, URL that I provided there. And there was a general anti-scientific impetus from this. The de Boren school represented a philosophical counter-revolution by old professional philosophers trained in the pre-revolutionary idealist tradition against the mechanists who in the main were actual scientists who held that the communist thought should be in conformance with the theories of the physical sciences. Now look at how the de Boren sympathizers attacked the science of mechanics and how this attack itself expressed Hegel's own worthless ideas expressed in his paper on planetary orbits. So what was, let's start with Hegelian's criticism of forces. Hegel does this on an explicitly religious basis. He says God's action is neither external nor mechanical nor arbitrary nor fortuitous. One must therefore firmly hold that the forces that, according to experimental philosophy, God gave to matter, truly dwell in matter, that they constitute the nature of matter, 
but this nature being an imminent and internal principle of opposed forces. But in reality, mechanics, he referred, by mechanics he means Newton, flees before that concept, understanding neither God nor true force, nor what the internal and the necessary are, but repeating that inert matter is always moved by an external impulse. What amounts to the same thing, forces alien to the matter itself. As mechanics deals with external causes and does not conceive of nature by way of reason, it cannot reach the principle of identity which posits difference within itself. Note the claim that matter is moved by external forces. It's not clear how one could construct any form of mechanics in which particles moved due to internal forces disregarding what other particles were doing, but uh, for some reason this suggestion that you have action at a distant forces, forces that act on particles a distance away from a particle, is seen as objectionable by Hegel. Now, if you take an article written in the 30s on the scientific method, by what we take, Greg Marks and I take to be an American Deborahist, we have very similar ideas being expressed. This is what happened to the atom, says Emery. When it was discovered that it is a system of complex movements, the mechanically minded natural scientists went on to search for the last unit of the system. By the last unit, he means basic elementary components of the system, electrons, sub-electrons, etc., and the force which holds them in equilibrium. If all the material points exercise only one force, contradictions can only be external. Therefore, no internal contradictions, no unity of opposites is known in mechanics. All contradictions which seem to be imminent are cut into two, externalised into the conflict of forces, embedded in different material particles. This is the heritage of Newton's mechanics. So this is basically Emery claiming to be a dialectical materialist is using the same language and the same basic objections to the science of mechanics that the idealist philosopher Hegel had put forward 130 years earlier. Now he's almost as confused about Newtonian mechanics as Hegel. He, not only does he echo the stuff about forces being external, but slightly later on he misstates um, Newton's definition of force. He assumes that all matter does, is immobile unless it is exposed to a force in Newton's theory. That's not true at all. Newton says, an impressed force is an action exerted on a body in order to change its state, either of rest or of moving uniformly forward in a right line. So for Newton, it's quite false to say that the natural state of bodies is at rest. The natural state of bodies is either at rest or moving at a steady velocity unless a force is applied to them. Also, Newtonian mechanics doesn't deal with material points. It deals with material bodies. And M the De Boronis Emery continues with this straw man of mechanics dealing with material points, even though Emery cites Einstein to the effect that no, mechanics doesn't deal with material points. It deals with bodies. And points only arise in Newtonian mechanics as a mathematical tool for approximating the behaviour of orbiting bodies, orbiting satellites, orbiting planets. His material points are a confusion between the mathematical treatment, which approximates a body by its centre of mass, with the understanding that the physicists like Newton had that this is only an approximation. And the approximation that treats a body as a point mass is only valid up to what are relatively low spatial derivatives of a gravitational field. If a satellite, for example, come, were to orbit within what's known as the Roche limit of a, platen, uh, uh, a planet, 
then tidal forces tear it apart. And this appears to have happened to the whatever bodies gave rise to Saturn's rings. Also, the stuff that Emery was saying about atomic physics was half-digested nonsense. There was and is no proposal there that there should be sub-electrons and no physicists doubt that the strong and weak nuclear forces exist. Nuclear power stations and thermonuclear bombs, for that matter, would be impossible to have been achieved if you rejected the idea that there were internal forces within the nucleus. Now let's go back to Newton. Newton says, the difficulty of philosophy seems to consist in this, from the phenomena of motions to investigate the forces of nature, and then from these forces to demonstrate other phenomena. This is Newton setting out his basic method. So the method he used was from observation and experiments on the ground to formulate general laws of motion, in particular, for example, the law of conservation of momentum. He then by, does by deduction using geometry derives general properties of what he calls centripetal, centripetal forces, that is to say forces directed towards the centre, the most obvious of which is the gravitational force of the Sun drawing the planets towards it. From observations, in particular observations of the satellites of Jupiter, he then deduces that the gravitational force must follow an inverse square law, and from an inverse square law it's then possible to deduce more accurate predictions about the planetary orbits, about how Jupiter will, will disturb the orbit of Mars and things like that. Now let's look at how confused Hegel was on this. Hegel objected to Newton's law of gravity and thought that Newton hadn't discovered anything new, that anything Newton said could equally well have been deduced from Kepler's law. So this is quoting uh, Kepler, which I'm going to show Hegel didn't understand either Kepler or Newton. This is and in italics is Hegel saying, indeed, the law which he, Kepler, gave, i.e. that areas measured by the vector radii of bodies in circular motion are proportional to the times, he would have been able to transmute into the form of a physical law, i.e. that gravity is proportional to the area belonging to sectors, and since the total surfaces of the circles A and small a stand in the same ratio as the squares of their radii r and small r, we know that um, 1 upon a, big A to 1 upon small a is equivalent to r, small r squared upon large r squared. And since 1 upon big A and 1 upon small a express the quantity of motion, and if you wish the quantity of centripetal force, he could have said that the force of gravity or centripetal force stands in inverse ratio to the radii or distances. Well, this is so full of errors and nonsense that one doesn't know where to start. Gravitational force isn't in inverse ratio to distances, it's in inverse ratio to the square of distances. But let's go and look at what he is saying about Kepler's law. So let's have a look at what Kepler's law actually means, because this is total nonsense. This is an illustration of Kepler's law. Kepler's law says that an orbiting planet sweeps out equal areas of its ellipse in equal periods of time. So if period T, let's say, is a week, wherever Mercury is in its orbit, each week, it sweeps out an equal area. But if we translate this into what Hegel was saying, the areas a and small a are equal to one another. 
because in equal times the planet sweeps out equal areas. So the ratio, what he, the ratio he gave one upon small a to one upon big a must be one to one. But the radial distance at different points in the orbit is not the same. So little r is not equal to big r. So one upon r squared, small r squared, in ratio to one upon large r squared, can't equal the one-to-one -one ratio of areas. So it is total nonsense. He's completely misunderstood Kepler's law. Why is he misunderstanding it? What he thinks Kepler's law says is that it compares two distinct circular orbits of different planets. Kepler's law is about sections of the arc of one orbit of one planet. Kepler's law doesn't state, out that, state that different planets sweep out equal areas in equal times. In fact, the further away the planet is from the Sun, the less the area it sweeps out every 24 hours. And we can see this with real data by looking at parameters of the orbits of Venus, Earth and Mars. So, the Earth has an orbital radius of one astronomical unit. It's used as a standard of measure. The orbital radius of um, Venus is 0.723 astronomical units. The Earth year is 365 days. The Venusian year is 225. If you work out the area in square astronomical units swept out each day by the two planets, you find that Venus sweeps out a greater area than the Earth, which sweeps out a greater area than Mars in a fixed unit of time. So he's com Hegel has completely misrepresented the astronomical reality. He understood neither Kepler nor Newton. Although he appears to have a superficial reading of Newton, he clearly didn't understand what Newton was saying about Kepler's law. Newton showed that you can still have Kepler's law with a gravitational force law that is of a different form than the inverse square law that actually obtains, but the velocities would be different. The orbital velocities would be different if the gravitational law was different. And I can illustrate the compatibility of Kepler's law with different gravitational laws with a simple example. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of calculus here, but bear with me. Consider a highly stylized, highly elliptical orbit. Um, there's a satellite going around the Earth. E is the Earth. At its perigee, the closest point to the Earth, it's at a distance 1. Let's whatever the units are, it's one. When it's, a when it's at apogee A, furthest point away, its distance is two. Okay, so that's a, a nice simple example. Assume Kepler's law of equal areas holds. And if the velocity at A is V, then the velocity at perigee must be twice, must be two V in order to sweep out equal areas each second. Now, if the satellite has a mass m, then by the formula for kinetic energy, the kinetic energy at point A is 0 0.5 mv squared, and at point P, where the velocity is twice as great, it's 2 mv squared, so four times as much energy. Now, the difference in potential energy between P and A, let's assume Newtonian gravity, and the mass of the Earth is M, we can integrate the gravitational potential from distance 1 to 2, and we get the product of the two masses, G over 2, uh, from the integral of R squared. And this and conservation of energy then requires us to have the difference in kinetic energy, 
1.5 mv squared equals m big M g over 2. So we can solve for v, it's the square root of mg upon 3. So we've solved for v with the actual gravitational law operates now. Now suppose instead of that, you had the gravitational law which Hegel seemed to think oper operated, that force was inversely proportional to distance, not to the square of the distance, but that Kepler's orbital law still holds. Now we'll have two new velocities, we'll call, call them v1 at a and the velocity at point p, because Kepler's law still holds, is going to be 2v1. Again, there'll be a, a difference in kinetic energy of 1.5 mv1 squared this time. And this now has to equal the difference in gravitational potential between the two points. Now we have a, a different um, gravitational law that should not, that should read r there, not r squared. Um, and that, if we integrate that, we get mg log 2. We again solve for velocity and we get a different equation for velocity. Very similar equation except they differ by a factor of the difference between log 2 and a half. Since log 2 is not equal to half, the two velocities would, orbital velocities would differ under the gravitational law, new gravitational law, at the same distances. The point is that you can keep Kepler's law, but the velocities will vary because the velocities are a free variable in the system and those can be adjusted to ensure that Kepler's law holds uh, and, and is consistent with the conservation of energy. And only observation of actual velocities will tell you which model of gravity is correct. So Newton had several different alternative gravity laws that he tried out before showing which one was correct. He considered gravity laws with acceleration being inversely proportional to distance, which is what Hegel seems to think the law is, inversely proportional to the squared distance and inversely proportional to the cube distance. Now for each of those alternatives, he derived what the orbital periods of the planets would be under these three rules. And you can see that there's a, there's a potential rationale can be made out any one of those, we know that in fact the gravitational acceleration is inversely proportional to the square distance and we interpret that as being similar to the law which governs um, the, the intensity of light at a distance from a, a light source and that is interpreted in terms of the percentage of the area of the sphere that the light has spread out to that you're intersecting. So gravity could be thought of in those ways. But just before Newton, Hooke had derived his law of elasticity in which force is linearly related to displacement. So linear relationship to displacement is a plausible one, or at least an inverse linear relationship to displacement. Um, and cubed a cubed law, well, that's you could make out a case for that as well. The, the greater the distance a planet is away from the sun, you could consider it in a, in a sphere centered on the sun, and the greater the distance away it is, the smaller the share of the volume of the sphere it'll occupy. So therefore you could say on a priori grounds, gravity should fall off as the third power. Well, so three a priori laws you could derive. From each of those laws, Newton deduces what the period, the relationship between the orbital radius and the period of it, the orbit would be. And basically he does this by saying that the centripetal force is directly proportional to radius and inversely proportional to the square of the period. He then combines this with the three laws of gravity that he hypothesizes and derives three period laws. That the period is proportional to the radius, that the period is proportional to the square root of the radius cubed, 
or which is what he what actually holds or that the period is proportional to the radius squared those are the three period laws he drives from the three possible gravitational accelerations if you actually take observations of the planets you can see that they fall along this line which is the inverse square law line this is the inverse cube law line this is the inverse line there are, this planet here Mars is slightly off because it has a highly elliptical orbit the ratios of the orbits only stand in this ratio if they're all circular orbits or all ellipses of the same degree of eccentricity so in contrast to Newton who actually formulated several different laws and then checked them against the data Hegel is disparaging about experiment he says we inquire into the physical reality when we inquire into the physical reality of the centrifugal force let us not strive after a philosophical construction of centrifugal force according to that experimental philosophy that Newton or rather the whole of England always considered to be the best and better yet which they always considered to be the one and only philosophy instead he says philosophy a priori deduces what the experimental method which calls itself philosophy undertakes to know falsely and with unfelicitous success from experiments seeking as it does with blind zeal by means of the senses the simulacrum to the true concepts of philosophy i.e. he thinks a philosopher ought to be able to deduce the laws of nature from his reason alone and based on his a priori deductions he comes up with a, a set of totally crazy joke ideas he deduced contrary to Newton that the earth will be flattened along its equator um, in fact the earth bulges out along the equator due to centrifugal force the actual measurements of the Earth's radius are that it's 6378 kilometers at the equator and 6356 at the poles. So the equator bulges out relative to the poles, the opposite of what Hegel claimed, but exactly what Newton claimed would be the case. He also deduces that the gravitational field of the Sun is not due to its mass, but to the fact that it's very bright and a source of light and he completely misses the point of the experiments Newton carried out to confirm that gravitational and inertial mass are equivalent that a philosopher of Hegel's repute for conceptual analysis should have so completely failed to understand the conceptual distinction between weight and inertial mass tells you something both about him and the critical faculties of those who admired him Conclusion. In his polemic against Newton, Hegel reveals himself to be a pretentious charlatan, unable to follow even the most basic structure of Newton's argument. And so far, I haven't covered in depth any of his last three idiocies, the ones about the shape of the earth, the luminous nature of the sun, or um, what was the last one? Yeah, the difference between inertial and gravitational mass. If people are interested, I can go further into the nonsense Hegel said about that. The problem is that thanks to de Boren's Menshevising idealism, a prejudice against mechanics, which was then called mechanical materialism, was introduced into Marxism. And this anti-scientific prejudice is even stronger actually among those people like the Neue Marx Lecture group who for all their anti-Stalinist claims would just reduce Marx to another Hegelian.